All right, so welcome back to Intermediate Micro. Uh, today we're gonna go through chapter 10 of Universal Economics by Armin Alchin and Bill Allen. And this lecture has the potential to ruffle some feathers, but it also highlights how real economists think about issues in the real world. So for example, in the spring of 2020, as the pandemic was getting underway, you might remember there not being enough toilet paper in the stores. As we were told, people were hoarding it. Whenever there's not enough to go around, most people tend to blame either the producers for not producing enough, or buyers for buying too much and being stingy. But an economist wonders, why didn't the price rise enough to clear the market and eliminate the shortage? Anytime there is not enough of some good to go around, or too much of that good, economists are quick to point to the price mechanism. If there's not enough, then we immediately presume that the price of that good failed to rise. If there's too much, then we immediately presume that the price of that good failed to decrease. We assume, therefore, that whenever it's able to do so, prices will adjust in a way that clears the market. Now, what does it mean for a market to clear? A market is said to clear when the price of the good in question leads to the quantity that buyers wish to buy being exactly equal to the amount that producers are willing to produce. In other words, it's when the quantity demanded is exactly equal to the quantity supplied. So why is this important? Well, this is important because it means that we're not wasting resources. Given that there are only so many resources in the world, we want to make sure that if we're going to use them, we're using them effectively. Producing too much of any one good is bad because it means that we're either not conserving enough for future generations or we're producing too little of something else. Likewise, producing too little of something means that we're either conserving too much for future generations or we're producing too much of something else. Now remember, we have to eat and survive in order for there to be future generations. So we don't want to use too little ourselves either. So how are these prices actually determined? It's one thing to say that the market determines prices, but what does this actually mean? In effect, what the market is, is an arrangement and process for comparing people's demands and offerings for exchanges of, well, property rights. People search for and compare options prior to agreeing to an exchange. So what this means is that we as buyers shop around. This competition drives all the prices for all exchanges for the same good toward the same price, which we just call the market price. So saying that the market sets price is a useful metonymy for what's really going on. Okay, so let's do an example of how this works in the real world. So what I've done here is I've just reproduced table 10.1, which comes from page 134 of our book. And what we can see here are the number of cars that each person, A, B, C, and D, uh, has. So that's the red number. So here, person A currently owns four cars, person B owns three cars, C owns zero, and D owns zero. And then what we can also see is at different prices, and these are all in thousands of dollars, how many cars this person would actually wish to purchase or would wish to own, okay? And so person A has four cars. If the price of cars were $9,000 a piece, they would be willing to only own one, which means they'd be willing to sell three cars. Person B, if the price were $9,000, they would be willing to own one, which means that they would be willing to sell two cars for $9,000 a piece. And person C, if the price were $10,000, they'd be willing to buy one. They'd be willing to pay $10,000 for a car. Same with person D. And we can go down this list just fine. Now what I've done over here, just like our authors in the book, is I've put up a total, what we could call market demand, which is just derived by adding all of these numbers horizontally. 
So at a price of $10,000, our four uh, people are willing to buy one, zero, two, a total of three cars. At a price of $8,000, they'd be willing to buy two, three, four, five, six cars, okay? Since there exist seven cars in this society, what we want to see is how many total cars are demanded by society at various prices. Here, since there are seven, what we would notice is that this right here is the same number of cars that actually exists. So what would happen in this market is the price of cars would converge on $7,000 with persons C and D each buying two cars from either person B or person A, <clears throat> leaving them with two cars for person A and one car for person B. And this would make everyone here better off. Now what's really interesting here is that in this scenario, it doesn't really matter who owns the seven cars to begin with. The end result will be the same. Cars will sell for $7,000 each. A will end up with two, B will end up with one, C will have two, and D will have two all in the end. And this is actually a really important insight into economics. Almost always, the initial endowments don't really matter as long as people are free to exchange with one another and there's nothing in the way of them organizing these actual trades. Okay, so in this video, we're gonna talk about the concept of rents. Now, rent is another one of those words in economics that we use kind of differently from pretty much everyone else. Most people hear rent and think of renting an apartment or something like that. While this is certainly an example of a rent, it's not all that there is to this concept in economics, and it doesn't really get at what a rent actually is. So a rent is the value of services from a durable resource. The clearest example would be land. Since if we think about it, when we use land, it's not like much or any damage is happening to the land by virtue of it being used. So if we think about this a little bit further, the cost of maintaining land is at some level zero or very close to it. And so if we can charge people to use the land, then the revenue received would be considered a rent. Now, Bob Tolleson offers us a different definition, and he defines them as excess returns above the normal rate. What Dr. Tolleson is getting at is this idea of the difference between what we can call accounting profit and economic profit. Accounting profit would be a comparison of the number of dollars that you take in and the number of dollars that you spend to achieve that income. We would simply subtract revenues minus expenses. Economic profit, however, keeps in mind the idea of opportunity cost. In most industries, the resources used for the production of any one good are bid up to the value of their opportunity cost. In other words, prices rise such that the opportunity cost of a resource is just barely met. And so in most situations, firms or any other industry are earning absolutely no economic profit even if they're earning some amount of positive accounting profit. In other words, the difference between accounting profit and economic profit is that where accounting profit does not consider your opportunity cost, economic profit does. In other words, economic profit is simply equal to your accounting profit minus your opportunity cost. Because of this, in most industries, the amount of rent that is actually earned 
is zero or very, very close to this. However, in other situations, this isn't true. So for example, my wife is a surgeon. If she wasn't a surgeon, her next best alternative, also known as her opportunity cost, is something that would earn far less than being a surgeon. Because of this, we can think of a large portion of my wife's salary as being a rent. So why is she paid as much as she is instead of just barely more than her opportunity cost? Well, in reality, her opportunity cost of being a surgeon is not being something other than a surgeon, but being a surgeon somewhere else. And so because her opportunity cost is really being a surgeon at a different hospital, her opportunity cost is high, and therefore her salary would actually be as high as it currently is. Now most commonly, rent is used in conjunction with the word seeking. And typically, this is used to connote special privileges sought by businesses. For example, if I were the only person in the entire United States that was legally allowed to teach economics at the college level, I'm willing to bet that the salary that I would earn would increase. This increase in my salary would be considered a rent. We would typically refer to this as political rent seeking because often the rents only exist in the first place because some piece of legislation has created them. For example, in the great state of Louisiana, it used to be illegal to sell floral arrangements if you were not a licensed florist or if you weren't being supervised by a licensed florist. Because of this law, competition for florists was reduced and all the florists in Louisiana earned higher salaries than they would have without such special protections. This created rents for the floral industry. We can also think about this in the context of barbers. In most of the United States, in order to be a barber or a hairdresser, you have to go to beauty school and learn how to cut hair properly. However, many people have done the dastardly thing of cutting their own hair, especially during the pandemic of 2020. And so what this says to us is that in order to operate a business, one must acquire this license. This license, in effect, limits competition to only the people who are willing to go and become licensed hairdressers. As a result, hairdressers and barbers earn more money from cutting hair than they would if this license did not exist. Thus, there is an element of rent associated with being a barber or a hairdresser. So where are these rents actually located on a standard supply and demand graph? Okay, so let's just draw a quick hypothetical market down here. So we have our downward sloping market demand curve, our upward sloping market supply curve. And in a market where there are no barriers to entry and everyone is free to enter the market whenever they so choose, price will be bid into this equilibrium point right here. We'll call this P1. And there will be Q1 units of this good provided. However, in a market with licenses or any other type of barrier to entry, what this ends up doing is reducing the amount of this good that is actually available. So we'll call this amount uh, Q rent. And so this amount that exists comes up here. Now remember, the supply curve is the same as the marginal cost curve, and the demand curve is the same as the marginal benefit curve. What we see here is that the cost, the marginal cost of producing this good is right here. I'll call this PL. But consumers are willing to pay all the way up here, and I'll call this P high. And so this rectangle right here becomes excess profits earned over and above the opportunity cost of these resources. So the rents would be right here. Now an interesting question, and one for political economy students, would be to ask, how much would firms be willing to pay?
and specifically, how much will they be willing to pay for these rents? Well, we can easily calculate the value of this by noticing that the value is equal to the price high minus the price low, right? That's a, a height of this rectangle. And then we want the width of it. Well, that's just QR. And so how much would a firm be willing to pay in order to have these rents? Well, the maximum they'd be willing to pay is whatever this product is. And so what form do they pay? Well, this could be paid in many ways. It could be paid, for example, in campaign contributions. So why is there so much money in politics? Well, for one, if you can get a politician to set the law such that you have an ability to earn rents, you will make more money. And if you can pay money to influence them to do certain things for you, well, then you could end up making more money than you would had you not paid them. And so this right here is part of the idea behind rent seeking. Companies and private individuals will often lobby members of government in order to secure special privileges for themselves. And those special privileges are just known as rents in economics.